Thanks for staying with us. Now, stripping naked, the act of rape, will mean to first understand its meaning and why it exists. Now, according to Wikipedia, rape is a type of sexual assault, usually involving sexual intercourse or other forms of sexual penetration carried out against a person without the person's consent. Now, the act may be carried out by physical force, cohesion, abuse of authority, or against a person who is in incapable of giving valid consent, such as one who is unconscious, incapacitated, and has an intellectual disability, or is below a legal age of consent. Now, Hawa Ojefo public, um, publicly identifies herself as a person who lives with a mental health condition and psychosocial disability, popularly tagged as the voice of and the face of mental health in Nigeria, Hawa has received numerous local and international honors and recognition as she continues to give mental health and sexual abuse a voice, taking back the existence, misinformed narrative, and normalizing mental health conversations in Nigeria. Now, remember, you can join this conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Ways Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways. You send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081. 8038463. Thank you so much for joining us, Hawa. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show this evening. Thank you. All right, so I, I quickly want to start with a tweet that you posted on your page. Because there's this misinformation, right? When it comes to rape, people always tag rape. Um, tag indecent dressing as one of the triggers of rape, right? And I saw your post and I was quite intrigued by that post when you said, dress properly, in quote, thank God Islam gives us hijab. Don't be stupid. I, have my hij I had my hijab on all through when I was raped. I think we should start from there. When you hear people talking about rape and they talk about the dressing of a woman, what, what, I mean, how does that make you feel? How does that make me feel? Um, I, I, I don't know that it's so much about how I feel, but the realization that people are really ignorant about what rape is. I think the general idea is that we think that rape is something that happens accidentally, or it is something that just happens out of an urge. Like, oh, I had the urge and all of a sudden this woman did not look very covered and so let me just go and do that. And we don't really understand that rape, sexual abuse, and all forms of sexual violence are really rooted in power and control. And it's very much less about the actual sex and more about that sense of misplaced entitlement to another person's body or control, controlling another person. And I think that's what it really helps us see. I think is the idea that we don't really understand what sexual violence is. We think it's just sex that went wrong. It's not sex that went wrong. It is power, emotion, it is control, it is entitlement, and especially in this dynamic, in my case in particular, it's entitlement to another woman's body, irrespective of any other external factor. Uh, you want to go? All right, um, you, you, you said uh, that um, sexual violence is rooted in um, power and control, so I would like you to explain that further uh, for people who don't really understand what, 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 what you mean by that. So when we think about sexual violence, and I'm glad that you started by giving, um, you know, the the definition and breaking it down without consent and things like that. You know, the the thing about it is, it's not it's not so much about oh I have an urge. If you have an urge, there are consensual ways of getting your urge sorted. But what happens in the case of rape in particular is that you want to take something that isn't yours. You want to show dominance over another person or group or, you know, for whatever reason. And that's really just the fundamental aspect is saying that, you know what, I can do it and I can get away with it. I can, I, I have the right to do it. And if for, for some people it is, oh, I have the right because I think because if you're not dressed properly, then you deserve it. It's not about that. It is being, it's just not, it's just having that entitlement that, oh, I can take what I want when I want it. And there's, there are no there are no consequences to it because it's not just in Nigeria that we battle issues regarding sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Not having a so system that actually is, yes. you know persecutes the perpetrator or sort of gives the victim you know that bit of liberation through justice. 
it is not just in Nigeria, and it's a thing of impunity, actions and consequences. When you feel like your actions don't have consequences, then it's really just you exploiting your power in that period mm -hmm. of time and trying to take control over a group of people or a certain person. Okay, our, um, from statistics, we see that most people, the accuser, sorry, I mean the offender, is always people close to the victim. Why do you think this is so? Ah, so th there are a couple of things at play, you know, and I'm glad that you also brought that up because it is, it's, it's interesting because every time people think about rape, or at least when a huge number of people think about rape, they think of it as something of how we, how we're kind of brought up. Oh, don't walk in dark corners. Oh, don't follow that bush path. Somebody will come out of nowhere and get you. The thing with, you know, most encounters of rape and statistically speaking, like you said, is that they happen by proximity, people who are close to you. And that's because they have the knowledge of you. They know you in a way that makes you somewhat vulnerable to them. So when people say, oh, don't go to a guy's house or don't go, I'm like, mm -mm. you are not dealing with what the issue is because irrespective of where you are at any given time, whether, whatever you are dressed, you're dressed with, you can't be a victim of sexual violence because the likelihood is that the person knows you, the person is somebody that you have invited, the person is somebody that you and the people around you have given some level of trust. And it is that bit of trust that is being exploited during the period of, you know, when there is um, an issue of sexual violence. And it's just because they have that inner knowledge of you, they have proximity to you, it is less likely to be believed when the person is close to you and they know what it is to make you vulnerable. They know your strengths and weaknesses and your attitude and your behavior and, you know, things like that. And I usually say to myself that, you, you know, with the person that raped me, I, I say, I don't know, did I come across as vulnerable? Did I come across as weak? Did I seem like I was like reading of innocence? Was that why I was taken advantage of? And that is generally the kind of thinking that a lot of us survivors go through whenever we get raped. Okay, I think uh, we have Anto uh, Antonia um, Oje Nagbo. She has joined the conversation. She is also a sexual abuse survivor and a rape recovery specialist. I'll come to Antonia in a bit. But um, um, Hawa, are you, do you think we are fighting this rape narrative? or this rape battle, right? Why I say so? Now, there was a hashtag, justice for Uwa, justice for Uwa. If Uwa had not died in that church, would the, would the justice, would the fight be this fierce? Like the way everybody hopped on the, oh, let's find justice for this young girl. Is it possible because the rape, because there are rape cases, right? Every day. That are not violent. There was a there's a there's a video currently trending on Twitter. I was appalled by it when a man was describing how he didn't penetrate a 12 year old girl. He only put his cap in his words. He put his cap. You understand? And that girl now, for instance, nobody knows her because, of course, it wasn't a violent case. So, do you think that we are we are fighting this battle right in terms of you know pushing this um, to to curb the rape incident that is prevalent in our country or in the world? I wouldn't, I mean, when people get tired of something, it doesn't matter whether they're fighting it right or not. It just matters that it is necessary for them to speak up and go viral and, you know, seem as though they are radical about their thoughts and their actions and things like that. I think every single year there is this one case that blows up, you know, this sexual violence movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it has happened in the past three, four years as well, where there was a case that was really brutal and violent. And then it sparked a certain level of what I call like collective consciousness. So it raises people's collective consciousness that, oh, my God, something is really going on here. And then all of a sudden we begin to hear other cases and all of that. I think that is one way to go. I believe social media has a huge huge a huge role to play i believe the collective anger and grievance of the general public has a role to play however beyond that it is where are we channeling all of this to so is it is it is it is it doing its job i believe it's doing its job to a certain level depending on what we feel like is the outcome of that is it to raise awareness is it to increase collective consciousness is it to target our lawmakers on social media platforms to ensure that they're taking the right steps to ensure that um you know um justice is always served 
Um, but I do, I do understand where that is coming from, hoping that, you know, this is not just another hashtag, another opera, and then all of a sudden it dies down and then we wait till next year till something else happens and all of that. The truth is that when it comes to sexual violence and a whole lot of other issues, including mental health, these are layered issues. They are layered because they are very complex. They are complex because there are also cultural and belief issues that intertwine, that make it harder to penetrate the conversation. And then it is also that there is a group of people on social media, but then there are, there are the masses that are in communities that we are potentially not particularly reaching with the right knowledge and information that they should be reached with. So that is why, on the one hand, yes, we can do what we can do on social media, um, but we also need to understand that there is the role of legislation, there is the role of domestication of the VAT, there is the role of religion and culture in shifting the narrative. Because there are people that you ask, have you raped somebody? You saw that man. He was very confident. I think mean, Wepa even said his child abuse is not rape. He was very confident in what he said. So you cannot tell people who don't know that they're doing wrong that, okay, this is wrong. You ask them, have you raped before? Say, no. I have to have you said to say a 12 year ah, yes now, no be no be no be with that. You know, so there is it's so multi-layered that we need to understand that every angle is important. And you know, while people are fighting a good fight on social media, a, a number of us obviously have to stay in the game for such a long time because we are the ones that are trying to see that there is a systemic change. Because all of this is not just about individual issues here and there. And that's why many men can come out and say not all men. That's not the point. There is a systemic issue. There, is, there are institutions and structures that enable perpetrators to do what they can do because they are, they are enabled by certain kinds of mindsets and certain kinds of laws and things like that. And that is the fight that we need to be in in the long haul. Okay, so I, I want to come to Antonia. Antonia, if you can hear me, where do you think... Um, I, I completely agree with you, Hawa. And I, I would like Antonia to, to help me understand where you think we can, if we were to start it, and it's no longer a hashtag, right? Both for the victims that are um, brutally um, raped and maybe at the end of the day maimed and all of that, or the ones that are just silent people coercing their, their victims and raping them quietly. Where do you think we should start to draw this battle line and how do we fight it best? Um. Thank you for having me. I think we should, we need to begin to draw the battle line right now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. So, I think that that battle line needs to be drawn right now. We don't need to wait for another disaster to happen before we decide to draw that battle line. Yes, the conversation has been and killing of a post-verbal Oh, I'm sorry. I think we would have to cut her off. We can't we can hear you. The line is muffled. Um, but Sansi, you're going to ask yeah, her. I, I was going to ask uh, uh, Hawa, sadly we lost her yet, but I was going to ask Hawa about the psychological impact um, of rape. And also, let's talk about victim blaming. Hawa, if you can hear me, I would like yeah, to get your why view is the on... stigma? Yeah, what is it with the stigma and the fact that most times people want to speak up and society ends up blaming them and then when that happens what is the psychological effect on the victim who most times decides to just go silent again it's about what we've been told about um rape or sexual violence now we have to understand why is it that somebody a, a lady in particular gets raped and then she goes and tells maybe family and then they blame her or they beat her or they tell her, you know, some, and this is, these are very common stories. I hear them on a day to day. I get DMs and I work with people who have lived experience. And it is because we have been conditioned to believe that when somebody has been sexually abused and it is them, they brought it on themselves. They were the cause of it. They attracted the person. They did something that made somebody else feel like, you know, go out of control. And again, that's why in a lot of times we cannot have these conversations without dealing with systemic issues like patriarchy. This entire idea that it is the woman's fault all the time. The woman is supposed to be the one to cover, but it's the woman that is supposed to not go to certain places. It's the woman that is, and we need to begin to balance the conversation either way. But then the general stigma really comes from that. It really comes from, oh, you know, um, not being believed. You know, I, I think when people are silent, and I, I can only say, for example, that, oh, I'm a rape survivor, am I going to name my um, the perpetrator? I don't know. And this is the dilemma. The dilemma is that we haven't seen a precedent that has played out positively. So why should I be the one to step forward and take that hit? Why should I be the one that will be torn apart? Why would I be the one that if I stand up and say, oh, 
I got raped. They would ask when they would ask me what I was wearing, where I was, who I was with, why did I go, where's the evidence, where's the this, and all of those things that just re-traumatize you as if the act itself wasn't bad enough. So I think it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's really tough because the people who are responding, maybe they're responding from a place of ignorance or maybe they're just really people who know exactly what they're doing and they're just hiding, hiding under the cover of they are feigning ignorance. But then the long-term impact is that, you know, the thing with trauma is that, and that's why a lot of people don't know, it physically changes the structure of your brain and how your brain reacts to life experiences. I tell people how I have heightened security, like I'm so heightened in terms of my security. You, you, you have flashbacks, you have nightmares, you have issues where, you know, you can't maybe certain colors or scents or, you know, sweat sort of trigger yeah, you. Yeah, and the truth is it has real life Impact. impact. It, it, has, it has real life impact on your so day-to-day our, interaction. Our, our, can you yeah. hear me? Okay, what yeah, about the criminal justice system? Do you think the criminal mm -hmm. justice system is helping victims? Do you think police officers are, are being trained on how to collect evidence? Because I've seen instances where a victim can identify the offender, but they still do not want to prosecute their case. Why, what do you think is responsible for this? Well, you, you rightly said is the criminal justice system, we don't have a system that is robust enough and has a lot of precedent. We don't have a legislation that has been domesticated across the 36 states. So in some parts of the northern states, the penal code still supersedes the VAP. And then some parts of the southern states, the, um, the, okay, the penal code and then the criminal code in the south still supersedes the VAP. And that is an issue. But now it's one thing for you to have a piece of paper that outlines what justice may look like. You know, and then it's another thing to scale that across the different structures. Rightly put, police. Those are one of the people who, you know, it's very easy for people to say, why didn't they go to the police and all of that? I mean, this is, these are the same police that was it a year or two ago, um, women ran to or were taken to the police station and then the police actually raped them as well, using pure water bags and things like that as protection. You know, so it's, it's, I think it's, it would be very, very uh, hypocritical of us to just say, oh, there's a law, maybe, you know, we need to report to the police more and all. There needs to be an entire overhaul of the system. You cannot tell people who don't know something to be the ones at the forefront in responding to it. You can't say, oh, police, when they do not have the training incorporated into their police academy sort of like curriculum for them to understand what it means to respond to sexual violence and to be, um, you know, to be the most human um, sort of responders in, in the setting. These are people who don't know. I mean, somebody just reported on Twitter that they went somewhere and then they were asking them questions. Are you sure you do not enjoy it? Why are you, why are you coming? Is it because, you know, funny things like that. And it's not just there. It's also in the healthcare system. It's, it's also, everywhere. you know, so again, mm -hmm. the criminal justice system has a lot to do. But so, I think it starts with, yes, the top-down approach is domestication of the VAP Act, which is already in existence. Nigeria already passed the law in 2015. But it's also ensuring that it is domesticated. Because the Senate has to do that. And that's one of the things that the Senate actually released in the past, I think, 48 hours after this entire thing trended. It was part of the agenda to address sexual violence, that they are going to try and put enough force on every state to domesticate that act. Now it's one thing to domesticate. Now, how are you going to take the act and ensure that all the systems in place and all the structures in place are able to respond adequately to sexual that violence? Is and thing the entirely. Thank you so much, Hawa. Um, we, we, we're afraid we, we'll have to end the conversation here because we need to go on a break. But I want to say thank you, and we'll keep this conversation going. And it's not just a one-off conversation for us. If we have, I believe that we, we can keep the conversations going to keep it at top of mind uh, awareness for everyone. Thank you so much, Hawa, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Hawa. So we'll take a short break. Taiwa Kilami will join us. Please stay with us. We'll be right back.